We have some updates to bring you from the Gaza Strip. On Sunday, the global call for Israel to cease its military operations in Gaza heightened as Israeli forces advanced into the heart of Khan Yunus, the largest city in southern Gaza. Diplomats and U.N. officials issued increasingly urgent alerts regarding the scarcity of food and the widespread displacement affecting nearly two million Palestinians. Jordan's foreign minister, Ayman Safadi, said Sunday at the Doha Forum, a global policy conference in Qatar, what we are seeing in Gaza is not just simply the killing of innocent people and the destruction of their livelihoods, but a systematic effort to empty Gaza of its people. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, more than 18,000 people in Gaza have died during the war, and another 6,000 or so are missing. Meanwhile, the Israeli officials stated in a late Sunday news conference that Israeli forces are engaged in a tense, intense battles in three key areas of the Gaza Strip, including Jabalia and Shajaya in northeastern Gaza and then Khan Yunus in the south. The military aims to eliminate Hamas strongholds in these areas, addressing concerns from the United Nations about the deteriorating humanitarian situation, particularly in the southern Gaza. Secretary Antony Blinken responded to mounting calls for a ceasefire. Let's watch. We have been a strong proponent of humanitarian pauses. In fact, because of our advocacy, because of the work we did, uh, we got pauses. We got pauses on a daily basis to make sure that people could get out of the way. Uh, that humanitarian supplies could get in. We helped negotiate the longer pause that re resulted in the release of more than 110 uh, hostages, and that also allowed uh, a doubling of humanitarian assistance that was getting into Gaza. But when it comes to a, a ceasefire in this moment, with Hamas still alive, still intact, uh, and again, with the stated intent of repeating October 7th again and again and again, that would simply perpetuate the problem. Uh, and so our focus is on trying to make sure that civilians are protected to the maximum extent possible, that humanitarian assistance gets in to the maximum extent possible. Uh, and again, if Hamas were to uh, put down its weapons tomorrow, surrender tomorrow, this would be over tomorrow. In the past few days, the Biden administration has vetoed a UN draft resolution demanding a humanitarian ceasefire in exchange for all hostages being released and instead approve, approved the sale of tank ammunition and related equipment to Israel, invoking an emergency declaration to bypass Congress in doing so. And this, just in from the Washington Post, Israel used U.S.-supplied white phosphorus munitions in an October attack in southern Lebanon that injured at least nine civilians and what Amnesty International says should be investigated as a war crime. This is according to a Washington Post analysis of shell fragments found in a small village. Mm. The United Nations said it will hold an emergency special session of the General Assembly on Tuesday upon the request of Egypt and Mauritania following the United States veto of a ceasefire resolution backed by the majority of the U.N. Security Council. All right. That is a lot of very heavy, very significant news. Just from a humanitarian perspective, the death toll rising to these incredible numbers. I remember when we were talking about this a week or so out, and we were talking about the point at which the number of people in Gaza killed had matched the number of people that were horribly killed on October 7th. And then I remember when it was twice that, and I remember when it was three times that. And now, with that October 7th number being 1,000, we're at, at 18,000, and who knows how many under the wreckage. And not to mention the destruction as well as to human life, to the infrastructure of Gaza, to the housing stock in Gaza, the oldest um, mosque in Gaza has been destroyed. We all kind of collectively mourned the fire at um, Notre Dame a few years ago. This uh, building was older than Notre Dame. I mean, the, the level of destruction has been pretty incredible. And then on top of that, to see what the United States is doing in the middle of this, not only voting to supply more weapons to Israel in its siege on Gaza, um, but also interfering in one of the few kind of global mechanisms there are to hold nations accountable in the UN to veto uh, the ceasefire resolution, I think has made many people feel like there is basically no way to rein in whatever excesses may be happening in the region. I thought it was interesting to hear Blinken say that, um, you know, if Hamas surrenders, it could be over tomorrow. Um, I did see a comment in The New York Times from, uh, from the Israeli side saying that, um, because Yasser Arafat left, that was like, like fled during the, you know, that, that war. So could it be a, what a, as a model for this to let um, Sinwar, the leader, 
flee Gaza under some circumstances. And the Israeli official says, no, we're, we're going to kill him. He's, he has to be killed. Then maybe the next leadership of Hamas, you know, in an event that's probably not going to happen, but could be allowed to surrender and be exiled from the area without uh, facing death. I mean, if you want, if you want to create conditions where, theoretically, the government you're fighting would be willing to surrender, you, you want to, I mean, just, you want to take death off the table so that they might feel induced to surrender. So that, even that, from the Israeli perspective, seems contrary to what Blinken said in the clip we played. Yeah, I mean, it's tough uh, to think about, like, how, how credible do you find those kinds of statements when, I mean, I'm thinking about a couple of things when I hear that. One is that in other kinds of wars and conflicts, we've seen the United States state as this objective, we're going to kill insert name of person. Right. And then there's a targeted action to try to kill X, Y, and Z. These are the, the heads of ISIS leadership or whatever it is. In this case, I think we've heard, there are a couple of names that have gotten floated here and there, but we've also heard a lot of statements from um, the IDF and senior Israeli politicos who say things like, there's no innocent Palestinians, they're human animals. Um, uh, there's a lot of discourse about who is and who isn't Hamas. Hamas. When, when we reference how many children were in IDF captivity that were released in the hostage exchange programs, we often heard, well, they're not children, they're Hamas. And we saw those horrible images over the weekend of uh, the IDF having rounded up all of those Palestinian men, stripped them naked and sitting them in rows and lines. And so many people, uh, people who are supportive of the Israeli effort there were saying, yes, this is a, a picture of victory, a portrait of victory. Many others pointed out, these are identifiable individuals who are, that's a journalist. That, that's a civilian. These are people that we know what have been following, friends and family members of ours, who are not Hamas. But we live in a world where any Palestinian man, whether or not they're of age, is able to be labeled as Hamas, and you can see treatment of them in photographs that violates the Geneva Conventions. And it's just accepted as, well, if someone said they're Hamas, they're Hamas. So Israel's saying we're going to keep going until Hamas surrenders while having such a flexible vi um, vision of who Hamas is, to me says you have an open-ended excuse to continue killing people in Gaza until you decide you don't want to kill people anymore. And I think it's important to note that, especially given that we have this 18,000-person death toll now and reporting by Israel. And, and an Israeli analysis found that— uh, uh, the Israeli bombardment of Gaza has killed a significantly greater portion of civilians than the average civilian death toll in conflicts around the world during the 20th century. So statements from Blinken and others in our own government that say, well, of course Israel is doing its best to safeguard civilians, are patently, obviously, empirically untrue. If they're doing their best, they're doing worse than every other actor in a conflict zone in the 20th century, in any other war. So at what point? Does America, who's, again, bypassing Congress to send more weapons to Israel, have 18,000 people's worth of blood on its hands? At what point do we stop? I, I don't know. I don't think there's any point at which we stop sending aid. We've said we'll keep doing that no matter what. I mean, maybe we eventually get—we'll um, become disenchanted with the mission statement if it is that difficult to achieve. I mean, Ham Hamas is—they are an organization. We can keep—we keep, keep, can keep— killing people associated with it or in its leadership positions. By we, I mean the Israelis. So we're well, it is. I mean, it is we, right? At a certain well, point. I mean, and we're providing no, diplomatic them, immunity but. for Israel. And if we're for supplying weapons for Israel and we're supplying more aid to Israel than we do to any other country in the world, think about the places you think of when you think of poverty and destruction and folks that might need our help. Israel is one of the most wealthy countries in the world, and they get yeah, the bulk of our aid. Yeah, I don't think they need our help. I absolutely think it's unfair to ask Americans to keep paying for that when we have so many problems at home. That's something Thomas Massey keeps talking about. That's something Tucker Carlson talks about. There's certainly a healthy um, um, appetite on the right for critiquing the America last policy of of contributing endless amounts of money to other nations' defenses, even when they're perfectly capable of paying for it by themselves, yeah. in the case of Israel. or when their neighbors, ostensibly allied with us, for whom the battle is much more important, are barely lifting a finger, as in the case of Ukraine yeah. and its neighbors. So I think there is um, there's so certainly some level of support, even on the right. You know, we can you know, work together to, to, to do that. Um, but especially because this conflict is just going to go on. I mean, there's, and, there's endless yeah. there's support for doing this. And we, we talked to mm -hmm. um, Zach Beecham um, about the situation with Netanyahu. Netanyahu might be unpopular, but the Israeli strategy of 
all out war with Hamas is popular and is therefore going to continue. Yeah, well, whatever, I mean, from a humanitarian perspective, I, I would hope that the world still continues to support the, in, you know, a, a call for a ceasefire, regardless of what anybody's individual country is doing. But certainly, the question of what the U.S. specifically is doing is a real one and a significant one. And it is notable that there does seem to be a bipartisan consensus of support for this action. The, the actions that Congress has chosen to take are not to stand up against Biden going around Congress to send more money to Israel. Instead, they've been using their time passing abridgments of free speech resolutions that say that criticism of Zionism, the ongoing genocide in Israel, is in fact anti-Semitism. You had the censure of Rashida Tlaib, the only Palestinian in Congress. And you have AIPAC reportedly pledging $100 million to unseating all of the Congress members, including Massey, who have been willing to stand up and articulate some resistance to uh, Americans' endorsement of this ongoing genocide. So it, it is, it's a really— it's a really tough. It's a really tough situation because it doesn't seem that there's any political opposition in our country to this. Well, but I mean, I think, sure, I, the tough situation is again to me is just generated by the fact that there's no, th there's very little opposition to what's going on for the relevant participants in the conflict. Like we, a ceasefire would be ideal. I, I, I hope that Israel would. You know, recognize and and, uh, and and the existence of Palestine and stop encroaching on the West Bank and give full po po political rights to the Palestinians or a separate state or whatever. And in exchange, Hamas would give up its stated goal of uh, eradicating Israel and continuing to fight with the Palestinians, or w with the Jewish people, rather. But neither of those groups are going to do that, so they're just going to keep fighting. So there'll be no ceasefire. Right. But the, the, there's a, some really clear, clarifying realities that we have to drill down on. One is that Joe Biden is backing Israel right now, saying, well, we're doing this in furtherance of a long-term two-state solution, at the same time that Benjamin Netanyahu is campaigning within Israel in Hebrew to his constituents, saying, stick with me. I'm the guy who's going to thwart a two-state solution. There will be no two-state solution with me. Right. And when we see, as we were talking about in another segment with um, Beecham, he has had a longstanding policy of supporting these Qatari funds going to Hamas specifically. Netanyahu has. Net Netanyahu has. Because it is seen as a way to thwart any more moderate political coalitions yeah. happening that could more legitimately advocate for there to be a two-state solution. And it has worked. With, and it, ha and it, it has, has worked. worked. Because the radical terrorist faction is in charge, and they don't want that either. Yeah, so the idea that you're going to get rid of Hamas— Hamas by another name, what, what you're not going to get rid of unless you literally exterminate and genocide and ethnic cleanse every last Palestinian, which at this rate, if, if we keep the killings happening at this number for another year or two, you will successfully do a genocide here. Um, but unless you're planning on doing that, you have now thousands of orphaned kids. You have thousands of adults and siblings who've lost their parents and cousins and family members. You have over, uh, I think, over 70, I want to say it's 80 now, but I don't want to misstate that, journalists who, some of whom have reportedly have proof that they have, were targeted specifically. You have bombed every single educational facility in um, Gaza. Every university has been bombed. Records, books, people's uh, insurance policy, deeds to their house. Think of all of the material that constitutes a life and your um, financial commitments and your ability to reconstitute yourself and your ability to have an identity are being completely and totally wiped out. If you are someone who has had that happen to you, why on earth, and you're still alive, which might be the end goal, it's to make sure that nobody's not left alive, and you're still alive, how on earth would you not keep wanting to fight for justice for your people in whatever form that manifests? And so the idea that you are going to take a people who are already largely migrants who have been kicked out of Israel and say and, and who have been radicalized by that process and then do that to them again and by orders of magnitude greater and think that's not going to yield the same results, I mean, it's insanity. I mean, I think their hope is to repeat, like, what, the, the, the textbook, best case of regime change ever happening in world the, the the Japan experience where we just we bombed their city and then bombed another one and we would have kept bombing them until we got the unconditional surrender of the entire government and then they all got on board with um, a western dictated government and there was no further violence or anything of that nature even though we 
killed thousands and thousands of innocent people. That's the Well, I will say here's a, the goal. a notable difference in those scenarios is that Japan had a country. Japan got to have a country. I'm not yeah. endorsing that political choice, by the way, but a, a, a notable difference is that the Japanese people had a country to be in and to retreat to and to grow in and to rehabilitate. And Palestinians have nothing. Yeah. You've ensured that they have nothing. And someone with nothing to lose has every reason to fight. Mm. More rising right after this.